The limited partner shares in the potentially outsized returns of a well-planned and executed investment, but as a passive investor with no day-to-day -day operating requirements and whose liability is limited to the extent of their share of ownership. The limited partner has the maximum leverage on their most precious asset, their time. Now they say you are the average of the people you surround yourself with. Are you looking to elevate your network? Connect with individuals that bring your average up? This is more than just a podcast. It's a community to learn, to participate, and to connect. There is no other community out there like this specifically for limited partners. So subscribe to the podcast, and most importantly, join the community at thelimitedpartner.com. Welcome. I'm your host, Jake Wiley. Well, all right. Welcome, partners. Again, this is your host, Jake Wiley. This week, I'm joined by Reed Goosen. So he is the co-founder of RSN Property Group and the host of Investing in the U.S. podcast. Reed, welcome to the show. Jake, thank you so much for having me, mate. How are we being? Oh, we're doing great, man. I'm, I'm really excited to hear this conversation. You know, having successful operators on the show is always an eye-opening experience. I'm sure you've had you know, the highs and the lows, and I can't wait to dig into it. But I guess maybe let's set the stage a little bit, if you wouldn't mind. Share a little bit about your background, how you got from where you are. Sure. You've written a couple of books. You've got a podcast. I'd love to hear all of that. Yeah, yeah. So clearly my my accent is not from uh, West Texas, as they say. I'm originally from Australia and I actually moved here 10 years ago, which is crazy to think that's 10 years you blink and it's over, right? And I moved here as a 26-year-old, so I'm, I'm dating myself a little bit, but I moved here just to really be an expat in New York City. My background's in structural engineering. I came here. There was a great visa opportunity to come to the United States and, and work as a professional. And then I was going to go home. And I was also, you know, I was chasing a girl out here. So I came here not knowing that I was going to get involved in real estate to the extent that I built it to today. I bought my first property for 38000 bucks, fresh off the boat in 2012. And now I've scaled the business to, we have about $650 million of assets under management, about 3,500 units. Uh, I've written two books. I've got a podcast host. I speak on stage regularly. I'd say all this not to boast. I just say it that if an Aussie can move halfway across the world and give it a go, then so can the average limited partner, so to speak. And I'm sure there's a lot of your listeners out there who want to, you know, they, they put their toe on the water as a limited partner, but they may want to go off and be more as maybe a general partner or an owner or an operator. And hopefully I can share a bit of the journey along the way to help them, inspire them to, to take that action. Yeah, I think one thing that you pointed out, which I think is really impressive, is that it's been 10 years, right? So you think about 10 years, you've got over a half a billion dollars worth of assets under management that happened to your, I guess what you're really saying is it happened really quick. I think that's, <laughs> that, that's, that's just a really inspiring story. So I want to dig in a little bit there. Mm -hmm. So how did, how did you get started? Like, you, know, you said you got your first property, it was $38,000. There's a big leap there, right? So yeah. let's yeah. let's talk about that a little bit. I'm just curious. Yeah. So look, a lot of people talk to me about, ask me about that because, and I'm an open book. I'm I'm an I'm an engineer brain. Like I try and break it down into its basic system. So prior to moving to the United States in 2000 and what was it 2010, I picked up the book Rich Dad Poor Dad. Right in Australia, in my cubicle, going, I can't be this small cog in a massive machine. I've got more to give in life, and that was the the impetus to, to go off and be curious about things that I wanted to be curious about. And really at the time, it was just like, I want someone to pay me to live my life. I want to go surfing. I want to travel the world. That's all I wanted to do, right? Like, and it quickly, the curiosity went into, you know, I had no idea what an entrepreneur was. It was a sexy name for a small business owner. <laughs> and because I was a structural engineer, I was like, look, I can build things. I know I'm surrounded by developers all the time. Maybe I should go into real estate. My dad had a bit of success in real estate. He was just a high school teacher in Australia. So that was the start of like the aha moment of like, okay, I'm going to pursue this in in, in real estate. So it started back in Australia in 2010. I, I, I went to local meetup events. I was saving some money to do a fix and flip. And then you know, fell in love with a girl and wanted to chase her halfway across the globe. And that's what I did. And so I didn't actually end up doing anything in Australia. And when I moved to the US, I was like, okay, let's repeat what I've already started doing or laying the foundation in Australia. And that was, I need to surround myself with people. I need to go to meetup events. I need to just be involved in it because I'm coming with an Australian mindset of how 
I do real estate in Australia, it's completely different over here, right? I have to re-educate myself about the lingo. I have to understand about, you know, LLCs and EIN numbers and bank accounts and credit scores and all that sort of stuff. So I was just, you know, trying to surround myself as, with, with as many people as I possibly can. And the US is surrounded and has an incredible tapestry of networking opportunities that are just on steroids compared to what I was coming from in Australia. Like I had a small little 15 person meetup in my local hometown, which was really the only one in the country at the time for real estate enthusiasts, right? Real estate investors. I go to New York City it is 300 people in a room at the Penn, Pennsylvania Hotel above Penn Station all talking about real estate. And I was just like, wow, this is incredible. I find out that these REARs are across the country. They're in every major MSA. So the access to information was just so much more plentiful. And so it was just more of like show up, rock up and learn. And over a period of about six months, I started to really get the grasp of, okay, there's these barriers to entry that are a lot lower than they are in Australia. I can go and buy a property for 38,000 bucks. Like that's not even heard of in Australia. And the big thing for me was that I knew I wanted to be an operator. Like I, I knew I wanted to control my growth, my wealth. So it was about being active as much as I possibly can. And to the listeners who are limited partners, I'll get into that in a minute. But for me, my mindset was always at the beginning to be an operator. So it was about... I remember vividly remember reading my nose stuck in a book on the subway and going, I'm going to only learn so much from this book. I need to go out and actually take action and go and do a deal. So that was the the leading up to the first deal. And, and and I'll pause there because I'm sure you have some questions and we'll get into how I've scaled it over the last 10 years. Yeah, I think one, you probably, you probably saw me, maybe the listeners who are out there looking at it didn't, but the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book is the catalyst for so many people I talk to, it comes up all the time. And, and I think it's just fascinating because there's so many books that are written about real estate. For some reason, that one captures people's hearts and then does two things. One, gets them inspired. And then two, which is really the cool thing, and you're just hitting on this right at the end, is that it got you to go out and do something. And it wasn't necessarily the book, but like the people that read the book, they go out and they try it. And and I don't I don't know what the magic is because there's like I said there's thousands of real estate books, that was that was impactful. But I mean, one, do you, do you have any insights? What was it about that book that that really spurred you on? Well, like when I look back on it, the book itself, and I haven't I haven't read it since two thousand and nine or ten. Like, it doesn't actually tell you how. Mm -hmm. It tells you a mindset, and you know about being an employee to self employed to a business owner to an investor. You know the the, the cash flow quadrant, and there's a difference between doing reading a book and then going out and surrounding yourself with 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 other people other like-minded people so you know small actionable steps done consistently leads to good results so i.e a lot of people read the book okay that's step number one all right i'm really intrigued how do i go find out more i might listen to a podcast i might read another book oh there's a meetup event okay i'm going to go to all that meetup event that's the next natural progression in this journey oh that the meetup event i met someone so who's talking about a really cool investment opportunity in multifamily or in self-storage or in ground up you know whatever it might be so these are the little crumbs of curiosity you pick up along the way but the whole journey is about taking those steps. So the book itself was the catalyst. It's up to us as individuals to go and go down that journey and pick up those crumbs. Because I've met a lot of people who I've said about Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and they're like, oh, I, I didn't really get it at the time. And at the time of my life, it wasn't right for me. So I also see the other side of it where depending on what you where you are in your life, the Rich Dad, Poor Dad may not be the right catalyst at that particular moment. So for me, it just happened to be that at the right period of time at, you know, ripe old age of 25 years of age. So, yeah. I love, I love that story. And I think the other question I have for you is you said that you really wanted to be an operator and you kind of came out with that mindset. And I think that this is kind of where the, the road forks, right? You have folks that are out there and, and real estate is obvious, right? It's a great investment. You know, there's, there's appreciation, there's depreciation, you know, there's, there's cash flow, there's all these benefits and it's tangible, right? It's not just some stock and, you know, somebody can't have some employment scandal and blow it up overnight. But why did you choose to be an operator 
because you know the, the reason I'm asking this question is because you know when you when you think about being a limited partner, it is truly like a passive. Like you don't have time, or you shouldn't have time to to be active in it every day. Whereas you've got operators that have taken the other approach to say, you know what, I want to be in this every day, and I want to work with limited partners. But tell me about your journey and, and maybe what you think the difference is and why people might go in different directions. I think it boils down to access to capital. I was at the time 26, had you know a couple. Of, I think I had forty thousand dollars saved up. I didn't have a lot of money. If I was to go put that as in a, in, a, in a limited partnership at the time, which I didn't understand, probably 2012, the Jobs Act only just happened, so it was before this big wave of you know directly investing in the commercial real estate deals. So at the time, it was just like all I can do is sweat equity, right? All I can do is use the money to grow what I have. I, I think the for me that's really important, you know, particularly some people who listen to this show, they might be high net worth people or high income earners. So they just don't have the time and the energy. So thus passive investing is a great opportunity for them because they might be more established in life. For me, I was, you know, 26, young, hungry, had a little bit of money to my name, not a lot. And I was, you know, I had time, I had energy to go out and be and figure this out, right? My, my mindset of being an engineer as well as also I like to break it and put it back together again, you know? So to me, it was, you know, probably lack of capital at the beginning. So I had to use sweat equity and the curiosity of just wanting to understand how this business works from the inside out. Well, let's, let's talk about the transition now, right? So you started yep. with a $38,000 property, which is awesome. And then kudos to you for having $40,000 in the bank account when you were 26. Uh, there's very few people <laughs> that can say that. Most people have student loans. You know, I guess really transitioning and going bigger, Right. Like that's that's a big leap as well. Let's let's dive in on that story a bit. Yeah. So it was actually at the end of 2013. I'm in New York City. I bought a couple of properties at this stage. I probably had seven or eight little little units. And I'm in New York City with a good friend of mine from Canada sitting down having a beer. And I said, mate, like, guess what I'm doing? I am buying. I've got seven little units. I am crushing it. You know, <laughs> still structural engineer, still, you know, working the day job. I think I was looking at a fix and flip in Philly with a potential partner. And he goes on to tell me, he's like, oh, man, that's, that's awesome. Well done. Like, congratulations. And he goes on to tell me about a 70 unit deal that he just did. And I was, I didn't even know he was involved in real estate in Canada. In, the, in, the, in that scale. And I was like, 70, like seven zero. And he's like, yeah, seven zero. I was like, how the hell did you do that? And he goes on to talk about mentors. He goes on to talk about other people's money. He goes on to talk about using seller carryback financing. All these terms I had heard about in my rear events, in those weekend warrior boot camps that you everyone goes to. And it was, there was a person who just set the bar for me, right? He's just said, you, you know, not intentionally, but he said, this is where Reed, I'm at. Like, if, if Scott can get to this point, why can't I get to that point? And I'd known at the time, Jake, that I was probably coming to the end of my tether with my own resources, right? I had limited resources. And again, I didn't have any credit when I moved here. So I had to buy things all cash, you know, hold it for a period of time, then get a line of credit against it to buy the second one. So I knew that there was going to head a ceiling at some point. And there, Scott, sort of really laying it out for me. And, and I'd probably put off getting a mentor for the longest period of time because, you know, I'm, I think I'm half intelligent. You know, I've <laughs> got a couple of brain cells. And so I figured out the first couple of deals on my own, but now I was going to do play a bigger game. I needed that mentor. I needed that person in my court to show me the way because, as I said, I was probably I knew sort of subconsciously that I was getting to the end of my tether in terms of where I could scale this. So the natural next progression step was going out and finding someone who I aspired to be. Now, I want to say that the first couple of deals I've done were all on my own back, so to speak, and I could I proved it to myself. And that's the importance of doing those first couple of early deals. It's the proof that you as the investor can do this, right? I came here, I figured it out. I talked to brokers, I got on buses, I you know, found out lenders and I was able to get close on a couple of deals, which is great in itself. But then when I wanted to take it to the next level, that's when I needed that coach. The sort of, you know, the Michael Jordan, so to speak, you know, coaches, you know, the best players in the world have the best coaches. So for me, it was about going out and finding someone who was one, affordable, because I was pretty frugal back at the time, but two, someone who was like, I aspired to be, you know, not not someone with gray hair and, you know, we didn't, we just weren't in the same age bracket. I, I wanted someone who, who I could say, I, I see myself in you. 
and I found that person. And well, let me were, let me let me jump in real ahead, quick because yeah. I do have a question. Yeah. Because you know you think most of the times like you go and find a mentor, and this is somebody you go and you're like, I want to be you. Like, will you just look over my shoulder and help? And then you mentioned you know them being affordable. So there's there's a difference there, right? You're actually hiring a mentor versus right. just trying to find somebody that that you want to emulate. And I guess could you let's talk about that for just a second because I think that that's a really sure. important piece of it that most people miss when they think about going to find a mentor. They they think they're begging somebody to help them. Right. Yes. That's right. So there is that side of it. There's there's the mentorship side of having a older colleague or someone in your profession who you know is is a sounding board and and they they're usually free and you know they they're just there when you need it in a professional sense this was more of i wanted to be in real estate full time i wanted to do this full time at some point i needed to find someone who was offering a service to coach others to help them emulate what they were doing so for me, there was a lot like there was the, you know, back to the rich dad, poor dad. I, I remember going to seminars, 60, 50, 60,000 dollars of, of mentorship, you know, and I'm just like, I can't even freaking afford that. So I needed to find something that I could afford. And here's the thing, Jake, the act of paying for mentorship is, is not the silver bullet that, you know, you'll hear this story and oh, I'll think, oh, Reed just got a mentor and he's just, he's, he's flown to the moon, right? That's not the point. And, and, and trust me, there was none of that. It's all hard work and we'll get into that. But it's the act of taking a bet on yourself. You're taking your own money and saying, I'm worth it. I'm worth going out and putting and investing in myself to help getting someone to look over my shoulder, to getting someone to be that mentor, to help me guide me on my path towards where I want to go. And that is the most important subconscious act of going out and getting a mentor. Does that answer that question? <laughs> Yeah, I think that's perfect, right? Is that it is an investment. And, you know, I think the the other piece of it, maybe I would add if this this is this is okay, is that when you invest and you bring in a mentor and you're paying them, you know, you do have that kind of relationship where they should give to you, right? It's not a I need you to do this of your own goodwill and hopefully like when I call you'll pick up the phone. You know, a mentor right. that you're paying for will should pick up the phone because you're paying them to. And I think that's the right, right way to look at it. And that, that took me a while to get my mind wrapped around that. But right, right, sorry, right. I know but, we but digress. Also, don't, don't forget, you're worth it, right? Yep. So many people don't don't even get to that stage of, oh, mentor, I don't know about it. You know, like I don't want to be like, like, you are worth taking the bet. This is This is the investment that you are doing for yourself. Because here's the thing, Jake, if you if you can't take a bet on yourself, then who can you take a bet on? And that is the most important thing because no one's going to come through the front door and hand you what you want to go out and achieve in life. You have to get off your own ass and you have to understand that you're worthy of taking a bet on yourself. And that's that's all. It's, it's as simple as that. I think that's a really good segue too here in the, the conversation, right? Because to be an operator is not just like you read the book, you go out and do it. There's a lot of steps and it takes years. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lot like you, you know, I got in to real estate early and I loved it. You know, I was, we was in there swinging hammers and cleaning things and growing the portfolio and doing different things and being very, very active. You know, over the course of my tenure, I've had a real estate license. I've had builders licenses for years. All of those things are important to what I wanted to do, but it made some of the things that we we're doing possible but it's not easy, right? And it takes time. So as we think about transitioning to being a, a true passive investor, a limited partner, you know, I think maybe let, let's let's take the conversation in that direction a little bit and say like, well, what makes a great partner for you? What should they be asking, right? Because it's easy to go throw your money at somebody that's like, hey, I've got a great deal. Let's go. Let's go make it happen. Right. But it doesn't always work out that way. So I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, and you're talking about the sense of the, the relationship between the LP and the GP, right? Yeah, and really, what does it take to find, like I'm an LP, what does it take to find the right GP, right? You've got to have somebody that's been through everything. They couldn't have just decided right. two days ago, like, hey, I want to be a, a you know, I'm going to be an operator here and I'm going to go buy this big apartment complex. Let's pile your <laughs> money in. It's a great deal. You, you got to do some diligence and you got to know and you've got to have somebody you that's been through the been through the mud. But, but but guess guess what? 
I was that person seven, eight years ago asking people for investments into my big deal, right? There's a point that every operator, we're not just born with 10 years worth of experience. We have to go out and earn it, right? It's through trust. It's through relationships. And, and, and so for me as an early stage operator, and I'll talk about this, the, the, the act of raising money was freaking hard, right? Because I didn't have a track record. What I did to compensate for that was use forms of media like podcasting like blogging, like having a mentor to say, I'm, you're investing in me first and foremost, and the deal is actually secondary. So in the beginning, when I don't have a track record, it was about who I am as a human being. Do, can people trust me to be a good steward of their money? And I, I, I still to this day applaud all my early investors who took the, the leap of faith with me because they didn't need to, but somehow I was able to show them that I'm worth my salt. And so in the beginning, it is tough. It is, you know, you, you're not, you, you're not I, I don't use this analogy, but you're banging the cup on the fence. You know, please invest in my deal. Please invest in my deal. Over time, as you get track record, as you build a brand, as you build your systems internally, pe more people are attracted to you because those initial investors start talking about the cool things you, you, that I'm doing within the business. So it does start from zero and you have to build up to, to where I am today is where I have over half a billion and I've exited six or seven deals and I've got, you know, really great IRRs and returns for investors, but it didn't start that way. And so those, those conversations in the beginning were a bit of a dating is the right word, but we had to sort of the, the LPs and, and myself, we had to like really develop a trust in who they were investing their money with. And, and that, that took time. It didn't just happen overnight. So getting in the space of podcasting, talking about the journey that I'd been on, using my personal brand and my personal story to create vulnerability with that investor say, hey, I really like what Reed's doing. I, I emulate with his story and I'm, I'm going to invest with him once he has a deal. So all those things, there's a lot I've just said there, but there's a lot of in, this, in the beginning when you are an operator, the, the, the ask is a lot harder than what it is today. And we'll get on to how your LPs on this show who are listening can vet people, but there will come a, there'll come an operator who doesn't have a lot of experience that you will ultimately take a bet on because of you like them, you trust them, you, 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 you see yourself in them maybe that that's why you want to take a bet with them. So a lot, again, a lot of things I've just mentioned there, we'll, we'll pause and I'll let you ask your questions. Well, I think let's, let's transition into vetting, right? Because I think that that'd be a good way to kind of wrap up this conversation. So what should an LP be doing to vet a potential operator? Look, I think in today's market, track record does matter. Like I'm looking back at, you know, 2014, 15 and deals were 50, 60, 70, $80,000 a door. You're buying at five, six caps. You know, there was just you, 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 it, it's a lot more difficult than it is today where the cap rates are more compressed, interest rates are low, but they're tending to go trending upwards. So you're buying deals at cap rates that are less than, so you're, you're buying deals with cap rates that are less than interest rates, so they're negative. So track record is important. I think it boils also down to um, your, the, the person's values and their mission within the business. So what do I mean by that? So when you're, there's a lot of operators out there. I'm an operator. There's, there's a ton of them. And I always tell my LPs, go out and interview a half a dozen of them, right? Everyone from a, new, a newer operator all the way through to an experienced operator and see who you click with, right? There's going to be that element of clicking this because you'll get people who buy into your brand, who buy into your company because they just... It's like Apple or it's like the iPhone. It's like people are just, I'm an iPhone person or I'm an Android person. You know, they, they, they just love the brand so much that they, they're loyal. So in the beginning, go out and vet a lot of operators, talk to them, understand their processes, understand how they're finding deals, understand how they're underwriting deals in today's market. What types of interest rate are they assuming in the model? Are they assuming a growth in the interest rate? Are they using a LIBOR curve in terms of, you know, modeling out how interest rates will get more expensive on a floating rate debt, right? Are they looking to refinance any at any time throughout the, pro throughout the hold? Now, Refinances, in my opinion, are dangerous because dangerous with, with an asterisk that you don't want to ever promise an investor that you're going to refinance in, say, year three, and you get to year three and the markets may have tanked and you can't do any refinancing. So 
maybe don't have a refinance in there, know that it's up the sleeve if it, you know, if, if things go well, but if the deal can still work without a refinance, fantastic, right? So understanding where they're trying to juice their returns, you know, to, to get a mid-teen IRR, you know, Let's take let's let's take out the refinance. Let's take you know make let's make sure we've got a floating rate debt in there. Then where would, where do we see where this deal really pencils out? Also understanding the going in cap rate versus the exit cap rate. Now a lot of cap rate deals today are are, are very low, so, you know, in the threes and the fours, maybe even sub threes. Is the operator doing an expansion on that cap rate in the future to say the market will get worse because that's what an expanding cap rate means? So. All of these things are questions you can ask people once you get past the point of, hey, I like this operator as a person, as a human. I like what their vision, they, what they stand for. Let's get into the nitty gritty of how do you operate your deal? How do you underwrite a deal? What are you projecting for me and how safe is my investment in this deal? And I think I really love the point there is, you know, especially in a compressed cap rate market, how are you getting to these mid-teen IRRs, right? Like, what is the mechanism that's creating that juice? It could be the exit. It could be a refinance that's in there. And those things, you know, the assumptions that are around those are really important to know. And I think that's a really key takeaway from this conversation. But Reed, I know one thing that you could probably agree with is that we never get where we are all by ourselves. We've already talked about mentorships. And I always like to end the podcast with a bit of gratitude and giving you the opportunity to give somebody a shout out, you know, that helped you along the way, maybe took a gamble on you that they shouldn't have and, you know, helped you get to where you are today. So is there anybody out there that you'd, you'd really love to give a shout out to? Oh, look, my, my first mentor was Joe Fairless, the famous Joe Fairless. So everyone knows who, who he is. I think I was one of his early students. He was a great guy. Frank Rosler is another, another guy. It's obviously Joe's partner. And then my early investors who took a bet on me. I think that, you know, I wouldn't be here where I am today without those people. So thank you to all of those, those folks who, who took the bet, who, who helped me sort of shine the light in terms of the mentorship and, and, and the path to getting to where I needed to go. And and again, it's 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 how we all get started. We don't we're not just born with 10 years worth of experience. So they took a bet on me. I'm very grateful for it. And and I'm so glad five, six, seven years later I'm able to return their capital with fantastic returns and and I've and, and I proved it to them, right? That's I think that's still I pinch myself today to think, wow, I actually did that. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's it's a humbling and and you know, gratifying um, business that we're in. Well, Reed, this has been a fantastic conversation. I really appreciate it. I think there's some great nuggets in here that everybody can take away. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Mike. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Limited Partner Podcast. Please subscribe and leave a review. If there's any reason you wouldn't leave us a five-star review, please email me at jw at jakewiley.com. Your feedback is always appreciated. The show is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the limited partner community. It's a community where limited partners can come together to learn about what best in class looks like and opportunities, and most importantly, a place to connect. There is nothing out there like this. So head over to thelimitedpartner.com and sign up. We'll see you next time.